Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Spiritual hunger can go to get fed. Sort of a religious restaurant in the community. If you think about it, many churches actually operate like a restaurant. Restaurants exist in convenient locations, surrounded by clear signage to attract consumers. They offer a menu of items to choose from, and even a special menu for kids. The professional staff meet your every need and make sure you are fully satisfied. Some restaurants become so successful, they have to increase their seating capacity or franchise into other locations. Their high-profile chefs turn into celebrities and gain a cult following. Sound familiar? Recently, restaurant-style churches have had their problems. As a result, churches in many places are going out of business. But what if we could reconsider church, not just as a place, but as a people, and not just existing on Sundays, but seven days a week? Imagine if church was more than a service we attend to get fed by professionals and programs, but rather, all the followers of Jesus engaging in God's mission. What if the local church operated more like a fleet of food trucks? Food trucks are small, mobile, and go to people rather than waiting for people to come to them. Each one features a specialized menu designed to connect with different palates. And because they are easier to open and led by small teams, more people can get in on the action. Food truck style churches prefer to operate out in the world, in non-religious spaces. They creatively communicate the good news of Jesus to those who pursue meaning outside of traditional church gatherings. The specific context they dwell in determines what forms of worship and rhythms of discipleship they practice. When food truck operators gather together, it's not simply to get fed, but to reflect, refuel, and recruit for the work ahead. Food truck churches go by many names and take many forms to express the kingdom of God, but they all share a conviction that everyone can contribute, including you. You can start a new group, pioneer a new project, or join an existing one in your city. Together, we can all reclaim the church's identity as a community sent to join the mission of God and embody the life of Jesus in the places where people live, work, and play. Now then, who's ready to get on board? Morning. That was loud. They'll adjust it. Don't worry. I won't yell the whole service. But good morning. Uh, for those of you that don't know, my name's Jake. I uh, am one of the pastors here. And if you were here last week, in the last two weeks, we've been in a, in a series on September the 15th. Two weeks from today, we're going to relaunch our small groups ministry. We are a church that has small groups, and we want to evolve uh, to be a church of small groups. We want to be what you just saw in that video. We don't want to just be a church that comes where people come and sit and listen listen to good preaching and, and, and good worship, and then they go out and, and they're not reaching anybody. We want to take the church to our community. We want to connect you into community. Our mission statement is really simple here at Summit Heights. We exist to connect people to God and others. We want you in a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We want you in a growing relationship with other people that are growing in their relationship with Jesus Christ. We want you to be in community, and we want you to take those communities out there 
and reach people for the gospel of Christ. And so we've been in this series, and if you were here last week, many of you were challenged to do one of two things, either for the first time, step out and lead a group, or step out of your community group that you're currently in to start a new group. And we got a great response out of that. I'm really excited, and I really believe we're going to have 20 to 25 different groups for you to connect in when we meet back here on the 15th. But what I want to do today is I want to talk to the individual. Because last week, Edward and Kathy Boyd, if you were here and you saw that testimony of Kathy Boyd, they really challenged you to what it means to be a food truck operator and to start a group or to lead a group where people can connect. And she said something in her testimony that Edward talked about last week that really triggered what I'm going to talk about today because she was talking in the context of what it's done for her as a leader, but the reality is is that each and every one of us need to be in community for the very same purpose. One of Edward's favorite scriptures that he quotes is in Ecclesiastes 4 verses 7 through 9, where it says two are better than one, for they have a good return for their worth, for if one falls down, the other is there to pick him up. But pity the one that falls and has no one to pick him up. What's interesting is the verses leading up to that. In verses 7, Solomon is writing, and he's saying this, again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. If you ever read the book of Ecclesiastes, it's all about meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. And what I just quoted was Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10. But in verse 7, he says, I saw something else that was meaningless. There was a man all alone. Think about that. Solomon's making his observations, and he says, oh, and here's something else that is meaningless. There is a man who is all alone. It says he had neither son, no, nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This, too, is meaningless, a miserable business. Now, in the context, he's talking about his work being meaningless because he's alone. He has nobody to leave this wealth to. But it does touch on something very interesting, this, that phrase, all alone. Solomon saw something that we still see today. is that for many of us men and women and couples, if we're married, we like to do life all alone. It's easy for us to isolate Edward made a statement last week that the enemy's goal is to isolate us from community. In other words, you know, once he's lost us and we've given our lives to Christ, he can't have our souls anymore. And then he goes into a different plan of attack. He doesn't want us growing. He doesn't want us serving. He doesn't want us really further in the kingdom. And one of his main ways to frustrate us and keep us from doing those things is to try to get us to isolate to take us out of community, isolation, to be or to remain alone or apart from others. You know, I started thinking about my tendency to isolate. I'm an introvert by nature, and I love to isolate. I have a recliner. I have a big screen TV. I love to sit in my recliner and watch my big screen TV alone. That's my preference, okay? I love to isolate. Sometimes I find myself in my office with the door shut and locked, isolating. Telling everybody, well, I'm working. I'm busy. But I'm isolating. Men, we're famous for when we're driving down the road. We don't want to ask for directions. That's a form of isolation. Did you know that? We don't want people to know that we don't know where we're going. And it got me to thinking of myself, why do I isolate? A couple of reasons for me. I'll preach to me for just a second, and so you can remove yourself, or if it lands, so be it. Why do I isolate? I think I isolate because I'm afraid to fail. And so if I can isolate and not really get in the game, so to speak, then I can keep myself from failing. Or maybe I isolate because I'm afraid to be seen. Maybe I know that I will fail, but I don't want anybody to see 
me fail. Maybe I isolate because I know deep down inside I have weaknesses, and I don't want anybody to see those weaknesses. And if I'm in community and I get to know people and I'm in community long enough, they will begin to see that I'm not perfect. Maybe I isolate because I struggle. Maybe there's a, a certain sin in my life that no matter how hard I try to beat it, it rears its ugly head. And so I isolate because I don't want people to see that part of me. Or maybe deep down inside, I'm just a selfish jerk. And it would be better off if you didn't get to know the real me. So I isolate and I try to hide. Kathy said something very interesting in her testimony last week, and Edward closed his entire message on those three points. They said, being in a small group will help you grow. Edward talked about how, how as iron sharpens iron, so one friend sharpens another. They said, being in a group, and, I'm, and I'm, for this message today, I'm going to substitute community for groups. He said, so being in community will help you through hard times. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. I got to thinking this week as I was wrestling with this, community can help me or help you through hard times. It's not a matter of community can be there to help us if we go through hard times. It's a reality that community can be there to help us when we go through hard times. You know the old saying, you're either in a struggle, coming out of a struggle, or you're about to walk in to one. There will be hard times. So communities help us grow. Communities help us through hard times. And then communities help us heal. James 5, 16, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other that you may be healed. I wrestled with those three statements all week long, along with what Edward said about the enemy's goal to keep us out of community and to isolate. And then I started thinking about this word that we use around Summit Heights a lot. And maybe you've heard it uh, in the offering talk. Maybe you've heard it uh, when we've preached a, a grace-filled message. Maybe you've heard it when we've preached about our, the DNA of our church uh, uh, maybe you've heard this word when we talked about our mission and, and how we want to be seeker sensitive and we want lost people to come and what? Be safe. You've heard us say that Summit Heights wants to be a safe place where people can come and investigate the claims of Christ. I started wrestling with that statement, safe place. What does a safe place, what does it mean when we say safe place? Like we come in here and we all put body armor on so that we're safe or we put football helmets on so that we're safe. We build bunkers in our backyard and we crawl into them so we're safe. What does it mean for a church to be a safe place? And then I started taking a step further. What does it mean for our communities, our small group communities to be a safe place? If we're going to grow, like Kathy said last week, if we're going to have a place where we can be when we go through hard times, if we are going to be a part of a place that promotes healing and helps us heal, it's got to be a safe place. But how? What does that look like? How do you create safety? How do you create safety in a church this size? How do you bring that into community? How do you know that you're in an environment or that you're creating an environment where somebody can walk in and feel safe? What does that look like? And then, as I'm praying through that, God takes me to one of the most weirdest passages I think you could ever preach on when it comes to launching small groups. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to John chapter 8. And we're going to walk through the story, yes, as we promote small groups, of the woman who was caught in adultery where the Pharisees and the teachers of the law drag her to Jesus. Many of you are familiar with this story. Uh, some of you may not be. Let me kind of set the context. Jesus is going up to the Mount of Olives, um, up to the temple. He's going to teach, and there's going to be a big crowd the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the law had made it their mission to trip Jesus up, to catch him in something that they could use to accuse him, to arrest him. They would often use 
people to do that. They would find a crippled man, like, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Or they would find a tax collector or somebody and say, you know, is it right to give to Caesar and not to God and things of that nature. Of course, Jesus, you know, would, would just always blow them away. Well, this time as he's teaching, as we're about to see, the Pharisees and the Sadducees go way out of their way to try to trip up Jesus. And in their effort to trip up Jesus, something unintentional happens that really we can learn from today as the church. Verse 1, John chapter 8. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning. He came again to the temple. All the people came to him and sat down and taught them. Verse 3. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? Think about this. Jesus is in the temple on the outside where it's public. He's teaching. There's no telling how many people are in the audience. I have no idea. Hundreds maybe? Even if it was 10, that's 10 too many for what this woman's about to go through. And about the time he's teaching, the religious leaders bring a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. If she was caught in the act of adultery, my first question, and I'm an imaginative guy, I read scripture, I'm imagining what it looks like, what it smells like, is there dust, is this woman clothed? Or is she naked? Think about that for just a second. They bring her, she was caught in the act. They bring her before Jesus and before this crowd. And they say, this woman was caught in adultery. And the law of Moses says we should stone her. What say you? Now, just for a moment, I want us to put ourselves in the place of this woman. Now, your first thought, I've never had adultery. That's great. I'm reading a book right now that Edward quoted two weeks ago. Everybody's normal until you get to know them. <laughs> we all have issues. It may not be adultery, okay? It could be anger. It could be lust. It could be selfishness. It could be pride. It could be you're a jerk. I'm naming all my stuff, by the way. <laughs> the point is this. Imagine yourself being drugged in front of a group of people, completely exposed. No clothes. Your sin is completely exposed. Your anger is exposed. Your selfishness is exposed. Your self-righteousness is exposed. And everybody's saying, this person who struggles with lust, this person who is angry, this person who is a jerk, the law says we're to stone them, Jesus. What say you? Now, here's what I know about living this Christian life. Many of us think that the church oftentimes acts like what the Pharisees are saying here. Let me give you an example. If I were to let anybody see my, and this is figuratively, unclothed self, my anger, my self-righteousness, my lust, my greed, my sin, the church would stone me. If I let anybody know what's really going on inside the church would stone me. Now put yourself in the place of this woman. She is exposed, she's probably scared, and she knows that according to the law, she's about to get pelted with stones. Verse 6, This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, 
he stood up and he said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And then Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. So Jesus, after the woman is drugged to him, completely exposed, and the Pharisees say, stoner, he begins to write in the sand. He stands up and he says, okay, here's what we'll do. Let the one of you who has no sin be the first to throw. One by one, they begin to leave. And then they all leave, and it's just her and Jesus standing before him. Now we begin, or I begin, you may not read Scripture the way I do, I begin to wonder what's going through her mind now. Because at first, completely exposed, completely bared, condemnation from the Pharisees, a charge to stone her, now beginning to see her accusers walk away one by one, one by one, one by one. Jesus, all the while, never really addressing her, talking to her. I begin to wonder, what is she thinking now? Is it some sort of relief? Is she getting more scared? Is she like, okay, when's it coming? This is a setup. I mean, what's going on here? After they all leave, and it's just her and Jesus, verse 10, Jesus now stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, in verse 11, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. And from now on, he said, sin no more. Now put your place. Now, what is she thinking? Now what's going on in her heart? Now, how do you think she feels? You know, it's interesting when I read this story, the verse that pops up, in my mind, you know the old verse, uh, I think back in Genesis when uh, Joseph said what God meant for harm, or what you meant for harm, God intended for good. What the Pharisees meant for harm for this young lady as they drug her out naked and exposed, God used for good. What the Pharisees meant to do to her, stone her, Jesus turned it in to a grace-filled message of redemption. And it's interesting, this woman who was in the act of adultery, we can't really forget that, and we'll get to that in a minute, was drug out and found something in Jesus that she really didn't expect. Anybody want to take a guess what that was? Safety. Safety. She found safety, safety from the stones, safety from the condemnation, safety from everything that probably was going on in her life at that time. She found that Jesus was a safe man. We don't talk about that a whole lot. We know Jesus is a warrior, that he overturned tables and that he went to the cross and he battled the demons of hell for you and I. We know that Jesus is King of kings and he's Lord of lords. We know that he's a phenomenal teacher. But Jesus was also the safest man that ever lived. Women and children all through the Gospels found him to be safe. Children would sit on his lap. And when the disciples would try to rebuke the children for doing so, Jesus would say, no, 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 no. Let the children come for the kingdom of heaven is made for such of these. He was safe. This woman found safety in a man, in a man who is God, by the way. She found safety in the hard times. Now think about this just for a second. Nobody wakes up at five, six, seven, eight years old in dreams of being a prostitute. I'm, I'm sorry, that doesn't happen. How that happens most often is through just a rough string of circumstances, hard times. We don't, we don't know what led this woman to be an adulterer. It, the scripture doesn't say, but I mean, 
we're humans, we have a brain, we can probably deduce that she maybe didn't have the best home life. Maybe there was no dad around to show her what true love looks like. I, I don't know. Dream with me for just a second. It's okay to do that. It's not sacrilegious. Maybe she was an only child. Maybe she was orphaned. I don't know. But, but there had to be some, you don't just wake up one morning. And my, my daughter wants to be a veterinarian. I mean, you don't just at five, six, seven years old have a dream to be a prostitute. I mean, something had to happen. Her life could not have been all that great. And the Pharisees wanted to use her for an example and inadvertently drug her to the safest place she could possibly be in the hard times. Remember what Kathy said last week, small groups is a place, community is a place that can help you through hard times. And she found safety in a man who had just happened to be God in the flesh in not only her hard times, but probably the roughest patch of her life. She found safety in Jesus, safety to heal. I mean, this woman was exposed completely. You don't think that a naked woman being dragged through the dirt by angry religious leaders might need some healing? And where at first she thought here the condemnation was coming and the stones were coming, she found safety in a man who is God in the flesh, and he was a safe person for her to heal. She found an opportunity to grow. Check this out. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I. Now go and what? Sin no more. Dream with me for just a second. Do you really think the God of the universe, the God of the universe who taught us and told us that we are to go and make disciples, that we are to model everything that we've learned to other people, you really think the God of the universe, this safe man who was there for her during her roughest time of life and who gave her an avenue of healing would just say, okay, now go and figure it out. I would be willing to bet you that this woman probably followed him around every day after that. Jesus was safe for her and provided that safety for her to grow. It's interesting. One of my pastor friends that, um, that I love dearly told me one time, he said, you know, we're not much different from the Pharisees, even as a grace-filled pastor who preaches grace. We set expectations on people and we expect people to meet those expectations. And oftentimes, while we would never physically drag an adulterer and bring her before Jesus to be stoned, oftentimes we put expectations on people that they'll never be able to meet. And he says, if you really want to be grace-filled, you've got to learn to move people to the next step of their walk through grace. We were having a conversation on safety. And he said, if you really want to be a safe man, you've got to be able to learn to move people through grace. And then he gave me an unbelievable illustration I never thought about. You know, when Jesus was uh, at the Last Supper, he told Peter that you're going to deny me three times. Oh, Lord, I would never do that. Jesus gets arrested, and Peter's out by the fire, and what happens? Peter denies him three times. Jesus looks at him when the rooster crows, and Peter, for that moment, knew that he was exposed as a fraud. Now, it would have been very easy, if you go to the end of the book of John, it would have been very easy for Jesus to go up to Peter sometime later, bring Peter over, spank him, preach at him, condemn him. I mean, whatever you want to call it. But at the end of, the, at the end of that book, if you remember this story, they're out there fishing and Jesus is, is by a fire and he's hollering at them, hey, did you catch anything? This is paraphrasing. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> they come in and Jesus makes them breakfast and then takes Peter on a walk and reinstates Peter. 
And what ends up happening is, is Peter, if you go to the next book in the book of Acts, you see where Peter's the one that preaches, 3,000 people get saved, Peter heals people with his shadow. He, I mean, just Peter is, just turns into a madman for Christ. But it all started with grace. Listen, Peter denied him three times. Jesus could have very easily stoned him, right? Hit him over the head with the Bible. But instead, Jesus told, was, uh, did something that I would never do to somebody that denied me three times and ticked me off and betrayed me. Jesus made him breakfast. <laughs> Jesus knew what Peter's calling was, obviously, Remember he had said earlier that he was going to build the church on that rock, Peter's faith. And then yet this guy who had such amazing faith that he was going to build the church with now denies him. And so what does Jesus do? He moves him to the next level of his journey through grace. The woman completely exposed and completely naked Jesus moves her to the next level through grace. And that's what safety looks like. You know, I'm reminded as I read this story that it's not just the woman caught in adultery that needs a safe place to grow and a safe place to heal and a safe place to be through hard times. Every one of us need that community. Every one of us need a place where we can go when hard times come. Every one of us need a place where we can go to get healing. Every one of us need a place where we can go to grow. Now, here's the the catch-22. Here's the tension. The woman was forced into it. She was drug into it and throughout any doing of her own, stumbled on to safety. Now, I so wish that we could do that for us that just an angry mob of Pharisees would walk in here. In fact, on September the 15th, when we relaunch small groups, I've, I've made some calls. I'm looking for angry groups of Pharisees to come in here and drag each and every one of us into community. That would be awesome. It's not gonna happen. Edward said last week, you're not gonna stumble into community. You have to pursue it. And there's no Pharisees that are going to drag you into community. You have to want it. You have to pursue it. But then here's the other caveat. We've got to be able to create those kind of communities for you to be in. You know, it's real interesting. Now, here's, and here's another tension. I want to be in a safe community, but I'm also called to create safe community. And even if I'm created safe community with people get out of their seats and come and be a part of safe community. And then I'm over here. Even if you created a safe community, would I go? And even if I wanted to go, would that community be safe enough for me to go? There's the tension. So what do we do? How do we create safe community? Well, I believe it's through two words that most of us will cringe when we hear. Vulnerability and authenticity. You know, over the last two and a half years, I've been on a journey, an interesting journey of learning about myself, learning that there's parts of me that I didn't know existed that most of you already did. I don't know why you never told me I was a selfish jerk. (laughs) I don't know. Hey, somebody clapped a little too loud back there. I don't know why you didn't tell me that I was angry all the time. I don't know why you didn't tell me that I was the poster child of ADD. And when you tried to talk to me, I wouldn't look you in the eye and I'd walk to the other side of the room. It's not my fault y'all didn't tell me those things. But that's who I was and that's who I could still be. But I've learned over the last two and a half years that if I'm vulnerable and I'm authentic enough to just let people know that up front that I can heal and that I can grow. And I've been fortunate enough over the last two and a half years to be a part of multiple communities where this is modeled, where a group of men can get together and be vulnerable and be authentic and be real and create safety so that when I'm in that community, when hard times come, I can get through it 
when I need to heal, I can get the healing I need, and they spur me on to grow. Remember Edward's uh, verse from last week, two are better than one. I have found that there's communities of couples, community groups, and some other co- communities that we're a part of where Ashley and I can be a part of a group of people, and we can be vulnerable, and we can be authentic. And while everybody's vulnerable and authentic, and, and I, this phrase is kind of, you know, doing life together, whatever that means, but, you know, growing together and healing together and going through our hard times together, that that's when those things happen. And so it's very interesting for me I have found safety just in the last couple of years through vulnerability and authenticity. And here's what I've found for myself. The more vulnerable and the more authentic I am with other people, the safer they feel as well. Because when they see somebody that gets paid to be perfect and they're not perfect and they admit that they're not perfect, then they can feel safe enough to admit the same thing. Meaningless, meaningless, Solomon said. I saw a man who was all alone. Then he goes on in verses 9 and 10. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either one falls down, the other is there to pick him up. But pity the one who falls and has no one to help them up. Verse 11, also if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can they keep warm alone? And then verse 12 Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, but a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And so at this time, I want to show you what safety looks like in the context of community. Because right now, I've just been talking about vulnerability and authenticity and building safe communities, but I actually want to show you what that can look like. And so I'm going to have... Some couples come up, and Ashley is going to come up and join me. Y'all, come on. This is my wife, Ashley, our children's minister. We do life together. We are one flesh. This is a group of people in our lives. Go ahead and circle up and face out. Link arms. Circle in. There you go. Now, let me ask you a question. I know you can't see Ashley, but she's here. (laughs) Now, let me ask you a question. Does this look safe to you? Because there are some stones out there that would love to be thrown at Ashley and I. There are some people out there that would love to take us down figuratively. There's some wolves out there that would love to take us down. And when the hard times come, here's what I know, is that the wolves and the stones would have to go through these couples to get to us. Now let me ask you a question. Does this look safe to you? All right, let me show you something else. Turn in. I told you at the beginning of this message that the tendency for me is to isolate but these people that you see these couples they don't let me isolate they know us so well we've given them full permission to look into our lives these men in this circle know everything about me these couples know everything that we struggle with as a couple now let me ask you a question does this look safe to you What can the enemy bring against us as a couple or against me as a man when I've already confessed it to these people? What stones can be thrown when every one of these people already know my junk? Does this look safe to you? Let me show you something else. Two on that side. Y'all go on that side, dude. Would anybody like to volunteer to come take a shot at me or Ashley and try to knock us down right now? Yeah. Yeah, it would be hard to do. With the strength that these couples provide us in community, you can't. And if by some reason, if by some miraculous way you were able to knock us down, they would just pick us right back up because that's what community does. This is how we grow. When we take a step back, they take a step back with us. 
when they take a step forward, we take a step forward with them and we grow. Does this look safe to you? Now, there was a time in our lives not so long ago where there was no Edward and Danielle, where there was no John and Kimberly, where there was no David and Catherine, and where there was no Adrian and David. Anybody want to take a shot now? You could probably knock us down, couldn't you? Because this is what the enemy wants. The enemy wants us to isolate. The enemy wants us out of community because this is where we can be picked off. What you just saw are the types of food trucks that we want to build. We want communities where everybody in that community is vulnerable, authentic, and where they feel safe to go through the hard times of life, to find healing, and to grow. And so over the next two weeks, as we lead up to our small group launch, we are going to be asking you to get involved in community and to take these communities out into the world. What you just saw right here is what the real world is desperately longing for. Real, authentic communities of Christians that know each other, and that help each other, that serve each other, and then take that out into the world. The world may want to try to drag you into being stoned, but safety is found in a relationship with Jesus and in a relationship with other people. Let's pray. I'm going to ask the band to come back up. I'm going to pray for us, every head bowed and every eye closed. We're not dismissing. We're going to enter into a time of response. This is the part of the service where we, um, we take communion. We have tables in the front and the back. We practice open communion. You don't have to be a member of Summit Heights. If you are a believer in Christ and you want to participate in the Lord's Supper, we invite you to do so. We also are going to have a time of response. Our elders are going to be up front with their wives And we're going to have a time of communion, and then we're going to come back. After you take communion, we're going to invite you to come back and worship with one last song. And then at any time, if you feel led, we're going to have people up here at the front that would love to pray for you, our prayer team as well. We would love to pray for you. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do, every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm going to pray us out. Some of you need safety. Some of you obviously need the safety that we modeled here that you can only be found in community you've never taken that leap you know it's interesting Edward made that challenge last week we had six new couples sign up to lead small groups just from that challenge and so I'm wondering many of you raised your hand last week said I'm not in community I'd like to be in community Uh, but some of you didn't what's stopping you from being in community is it that you're like me and you would prefer to be alone. You don't want people to see your faults. You don't want people to see your failures. Man, I get it. I was there. I walked with Christ for a while and still tried to isolate myself from other Christians because I didn't want anybody to discover the real me. And then when I finally decided to be vulnerable, when I finally decided to be authentic, people said, we already knew that about you. People already know that you're not perfect. Quit hiding. You could take a big step today by coming to one of these elders or to one of our prayer teams or one of our Grace Place members and just come up to them and say, you know what? I want to be exposed today. Here I am. Pray for me. Some of you need the safety that can only be found in Jesus Christ. You don't know Christ. You come every Sunday and you hear about a relationship with Christ, but you know you don't have one. And I would invite you to respond. 
I would invite you to drag yourself exposed up here, grab an elder and say, I need the safety of salvation that can only be found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Whatever that looks like for you, I invite you. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the safety that we find in him. Father, as we take communion, be glorified. As we respond, be glorified. As we worship, be glorified. God, I love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day. And listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.